Texas CVA cerebrovascular accident, we're talking about a stroke, right? You should also know that there's something that precedes a stroke. Um, it's called a transient yeah, ischemic attack. And that's your TIA. And um, in, in a TIA, In a TIA, um, this is temporary ischemia to the brain that manifests like a stroke, but the main difference is that there's no necrosis of the tissue, so the patient regains their function a lot faster than they do when you actually have a CVA, okay? So a CVA is an actual stroke. Compared to what? So this is like temporary ischemia. Instead of like a heart attack? So we're talking about the brain though, right? But that's a good analogy. So you guys recall angina for the heart? Temporary ischemia, you get chest pain, but does the muscle die? No. no, right? But it can lead to a heart attack. Well, now think about the same concept in the brain. You have atherosclerotic plaque all over the blood vessels in the brain, and when you have a moment of temporary ischemia to the brain, that's called a TIA, and you'll have hemiparesis. You'll have halfway weaknesses, and it's temporary. But then the patient gets better. That's a TIA. Now, the heart attack that occurs with the heart, it's the muscle actually dies. Does that make sense? And then that, of course, can kill the patient. It takes a lot longer for the patient to recover. That's your CVA, that's your stroke. The patient actually has an infarct of the brain tissue, and there's gonna be permanent deficits depending on what part of the brain it affects. Does that make sense? So let's talk about CVA then. So you should consider that there's two hemispheres of the brain, right? Excuse my little bootleg drawing, but you guys get the gist. You have, the, uh, you have the right hemisphere and you have the left hemisphere. A couple of components you guys need to know about the, how the brain functions. Um, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. And then the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. You have to know that, okay? Because when we're talking about deficits, meaning a lack of ability of something, the patient's usually gonna develop something called hemiparesis, which is half of the body uh, weak, is weak, or weakness in half of the body, or you'll have hemiplegia, which is half of the body is paralyzed. And so you will have varying degrees of either of these two when we talk about um, the deficits. But you guys should consider this, these different terms. You have some, go ahead. Hemiplegia is halfway body, Hemi is always going to be half, right? The paresis is weakness and the plegia is paralysis. So it varies depending on the extent of the, uh, of the infarct of the brain. So you have this terminology that you have to get accustomed to. You have something called ipsilateral. Ipsilateral means the same side, okay? Ipsilateral means the same side. Now, why do you guys have to know that? Because if you have a stroke that's on the right hemisphere, the part of your body that you can use is the ipsilateral side. I'm gonna say that again. If you have a stroke on the right hemisphere of the brain, the part of the body that you can use is the ipsilateral side, the same side as where you had the stroke. Does that make sense? And then you have to know another term called contralateral. And that's gonna be your opposite. So when somebody has a right hemisphere stroke, the affected side is the contralateral side, or the opposite side. Does that make sense, guys? So make sure you guys know this terminology when we talk about strokes. So let's pretend that we had a stroke on the left hemisphere. I want you guys to associate left hemisphere damage with language issues. Okay, think of L for language. You know, like we discussed heart failure, L for lungs. Well, in this case, when you have a left-sided hemisphere stroke, the main thing that you're gonna witness with these patients are limitations in their language ability. They may have expressive receptive aphasia, but their issue is gonna be with speech. They're also gonna potentially have this thing called dysarthria. And dysarthria is just um, like jarbled speech patterns. They can't really formulate speech patterns, and that's also part of it, especially later, uh, initially in the uh, stroke. So I want you guys to associate left language. Right is a little bit different. The patient will always think that he or she is right. 
I want you to associate it with that. Because the right side of the brain is primarily responsible for your, your understanding of spatial ability, your spatial location. So your right side of the brain, it details with your communication that if your arm is up or your arm is down or you're laying in a specific position, it's the right side of the brain that can discern the difference between where your body is at in space. Does that make sense, guys? So when the patient has a right-sided stroke, they have no idea that they have a stroke, at least for generalizations, when it comes to understanding the difference between right and left-sided stroke. So your patient that has a right-sided stroke, they become belligerent because you'll tell them, sir, ma'am, you know, can you please move your arm or can you please do, what are you talking about? I don't feel nothing. Their language ability is still intact because we said that the left side of the brain is what's primarily concerned with language, right? In the real world, this does not apply. But in the context of theory and NCLEX test taking, this is the, um, the ideal situation that we're working with. These are the rules. So left-sided stroke, language issues. Right-sided stroke, the patient thinks that he or she is right. More like personality. Yeah, because they have no idea that they have a stroke. They can't really feel it. So when you start telling them, sir, can you do this? They get annoyed with you. Like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. No, you're not. And a lot of this, the issues is, Disuse syndrome, like the arm, it'll be the contralateral side of the body is affected. They'll have limb issues because their arm could literally get stuck behind their back while they're laying in bed, and now they're gonna have issues with the arm and they won't be able to feel anything. So that's why you have to educate your patients a lot. I want you guys to base your understanding of that behavior as the foundation of how the patient is going to react. Let me elaborate on that. The patient that has a left-sided stroke they know they had a left side. They, they know that they have a stroke because they can sense the perception, their, their sensory perception is off, right? Because the right's still intact. But these patients that have a left sided stroke, they're gonna develop depression. Why is that? As opposed to right sided strokes? Because they're now disabled? Well, they know about it, they understand it. Maybe they can't communicate it, but they know, man, I'm messed up, I can't move this part of my body. They understand that they had a stroke because they can feel it, because that part of the brain is still intact. So left, people that have a left hemi hemisphere stroke, I want you guys to associate that with, yeah, these patients will develop depression, but your people with the right-sided stroke, they won't, because they sometimes don't really understand that they had that stroke, they can't, it doesn't really hit home yet. At least that's how I want you guys to associate it. Does that make sense? And um, because of this whole issue with them thinking that they're right, safety becomes a huge issue for these patients because they're the ones that are trying to climb out of bed. They're the ones that become belligerent with you and they're, they're gonna be non-compliant, okay? Any patient who has a stroke, their issue is dysphagia. Now what's dysphagia? Yeah, difficulty swallowing. Yeah, so they're gonna have a high risk for what? For aspiration. So even though we see the CNAs feeding all patients at the facilities or our UAPs, we cannot and we cannot um, we cannot ask a CNA to feed this patient. Any patient who has um, uh, aspiration risk. We don't do it. We don't delegate it to that to the to the CNA. Does that make sense, guys? I know in the facilities they feed all patients. I get it, but I'm talking about theory. You all with me on that? Okay. And also, um, people who have strokes. Let me see. What else am I missing? Um, there's two basic types of strokes. There's um, ischemic, which usually happens because of a clot in one of these cerebral arteries, and that's what leads to the uh, necrosis. And then you have hemorrhagic. And of course, that's bleed. Um, hemorrhagic strokes usually happen when the blood vessel ruptures, and if the blood vessel is supposed to be feeding, you know, perfusing your, your neurons, and if there's a hole in the vessel, that blood's gonna leak out, and it's not going to get to the actual neuron, and so therefore you develop a stroke. You also develop brain tissue. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. Um, keep in mind that the hemorrhagic stroke is going to be accompanied with an explosive headache and, a, and the deficits, of course. And that's important for you guys to know because we treat both of these different. If somebody has a clot, what type of medications do you suspect we're going to give them? 
not blood thinners, because those only thin the blood out. We have an active clot in this scenario that I'm describing. Yeah, the dissolved. So we're talking about thrombolytic drugs. So if the patient has a bleeding stroke and we miscalculate the type of stroke that they had and we give them thrombolytic drugs that dissolve blood clots, that patient's gonna die because you're just gonna exacerbate the bleeding and you're not gonna be able to stop it because you're giving them medications that dissolve blood clots. So it's imperative that the nurse does their assessment adequately so we can relay that information to the doctor so the doctor can offer the proper diagnostic testing so they can confirm that the patient has the right type of stroke. Does that make sense? Both of these patients, whether it's ischemic or whether it's bleeding, they're gonna have inflammation. So what's gonna go up, folks? Huh? Okay, yeah, but there's inflammation in the brain. Huh? What did we just talk about? Increase. ICP. Increased ICP. Increased ICP. That's what's going to happen to either of these two patients. Does that make sense, folks? They're both going to, yeah, they're both going to have ICP. But hemorrhagic one because they're bleeding into the brain tissue and now there's no, it's filling up that cavity. And then the ischemic stroke, the thrombotic stroke, because whenever you have necrosis of tissue, you have inflammation. And you see how both of them will result in ICP? That it's going to increase? One more thing. There's something called hemi anopsia or hemi anopia. This is an important topic. Um, we have our eyeballs, let's say, right here. You guys know that the eyeballs are essentially part of your brain because they're like so connected to it. And so, remember, normally this is how it works. The optic nerve from the eyeball, they go to the opposite side of the brain, to the occipital lobe, because that's what's responsible for vision. But when you have a stroke, there's something called the optic chiasm. You don't have to know this, but I just, let me just talk about it real quick. The, the optic chiasm is the area where the optic nerves cross each other as they're making their way to the op occipital lobe. Does that make sense? And so depending on where on the brain you have the necrotic, the, 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 the issue, the necrosis, sometimes when the necrosis in, is in just the right spot, it'll affect both visual fields. Let me pause real quick and retract something. When we discuss right hemisphere stroke, the contralateral side will be affected, right? So sometimes it affects the left eye, that the contralateral side, but in some instances, the death of the tissue occurs at the optic chiasm, at the area where both optic nerves cross each other, so it's gonna affect both eyes. And when it does that, you develop I'm just drawing the line so you can see what part of uh, is affected. Depending on what side you have the stroke on, it's gonna affect your visual field, on uh, your both visual fields, but on the same side of the visual field. So for example, if I have a stroke and I have right-sided hemianopsia, that means that both right sides of my visual field are gonna be obstructed. I won't be able to see well. Does that make sense? 